All right, welcome to this episode of Photo Theology. I'm your host, Doug, and today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at the Nikon D800E versus the Sony A99, or Alpha 99, whatever you want to call it. Um, we're going to be doing a resolution test. Now, there are a couple of reasons why I'm going to do this test. Uh, the first thing is this, is that if you guys have just seen the Fuji test, keep in mind that is not a full frame sensor. This will actually be a full frame sensor, number one. Number two, to some people, it's not just about having a camera that can take a large resolution in terms of a picture, but it's also about video capability. And although I'm not going to go through the video with you, because, I mean, you can watch YouTube and you can see videos for yourself. I really don't need to do that kind of stuff. Um, or at least I don't feel like doing it right now, anyways. Sometimes it's a given, it's a take. And the question here is this, is that Sony has pushed very hard to enter the full frame market. Their Alpha 900 or A900 was not nearly as successful as some thought it would be. Even though it was 24 megapixels and a whole bunch of other things, it was still a conventional camera at the time it was made. But now what you have is you have a situation where you've got video, you have high-speed shooting, you have a dual sensor mirror system um, that the, uh, the Sony uses, and uh, you got a whole bunch of stuff okay, going on with the camera that I'm not going to get into because we only have so much time. The big thing is this, though, is Nikon also has their heavy hitter. And the question is this. For $3,000, they both cost $3,000, all right, who is going to offer you the best resolution plus great video? Now, video, I'm going to give it to Sony um, because Sony does video and they do it perfectly. But regardless of that, Okay, the Nikon obviously can record great video too, and that's that. So it comes down to the camera itself in terms of its picture-taking abilities. Because actually, that heavily impacts how the video is regardless. Okay, so for example, if your camera can't take a picture with great dynamic range, it's not going to be shooting a video with great dynamic range. If your camera doesn't present the proper colors the way it should initially when it's taking a picture, then how can you expect that for video? You really can't. Because what happens is your video architecture is based off of your picture taking architecture. That's just how it works. So we don't necessarily need to look at video per se to figure out which one would take better video. All we got to do is look at this. Now, the Sony's 24 megapixels, want to point that out, it was interpolated like the Fuji was, no difference there. And the reason why I did this was because the Nikon is sold as a 36 megapixel camera. A lot of people sit up here and believe that, man, 36 megapixels, all oh, this is so awesome. There's nothing that can touch the Nikon D800E. Well, that might have been true up until my Fuji video came out and this video coming out right here. Um, undeniably, the Sony versus the Nikon, the Nikon gets crushed. Sony has a sharper image, Sony has better colors, Sony has better dynamic range. All right, it's, it, there's no comparison here. The Nikon arguably is better, once again, on noise control. And that is arguably, because you have to look at what you're giving up, and I keep stressing that. You gotta look at what you give up versus what you gain, all right? If the fact is the camera can't take the proper color of yellow, or if it can't do the proper color of red, and Nikon has always had issues uh, with red. Um, going back to, I want to say, like your uh, some of your older Nikon models before the uh, D800 ever came out. They've always had an issue of red. Either it's oversaturated, or it's some orangish tint to it, or something crazy. But anyways, um... If it can't do those kind of things, all right, the simple things of what you would expect when you're taking a picture, meaning you want your colors to look the way they should, you want your dynamic range to be, uh, to be the way it should be presented properly in the picture, then you have to ask yourself, what good is noise control to you? 
You know, if red comes out like orange, then that's a problem. Now, of course, you can sit up here and use Photoshop and, you know, have it interpretate the image of the Nikon. You can do five million different things uh, to fix these corrections um, that are going to need to take place, or they will be corrections that are going to fix the issue that's going to take place. That's how I should have worded that. But in reality, I have a very simple idea about these kind of things, which is when I hold the camera up and when I take a picture, I expect the camera to be able to capture within a certain margin of error what I see. Now, this may be based on the fact that I primarily use Fuji and Pentex when I shoot. But something I have to stress about this situation specifically is that Nikon got their sensor from Sony. So where with the Fuji, we could have sat up here and said, well, you know, Fuji has their own technology. They're, you know, simply, arguably the best for the price when you talk about lighting, color, and uh, dynamic range. Yeah, you could do all those things with Fuji. Okay, maybe, maybe you can't. All right. But now we're talking about Nikon having the same sensor that Sony has. And what you're really talking about is what both manufacturers want to go after. Now, I don't think the D800E is a bad camera. What I think is they should have taken a little more time. That's all, just taking a little more time. You know, Sony didn't come out with their SLR until four years after. I mean, the A900 to the, to the A99, you're talking four years. But in four years, if you look at those two cameras, if you look at the leaps and bounds Sony has jumped from camera to camera, hey, it was worth it. Based on these results, it's definitely worth it. The fact you got the video and the fact that you have high resolutions that you've been able to keep, the fact that you have proper coloring, proper balancing. Speed-wise, the Sony will shoot six frames a second. Its autofocusing is a point one two seven. Nikon's is a point two zero nine. I mean, in the end, there's just there's no excuse to this kind of failure on Nikon's part. Now, this is. This is not the only camera I can point to Nikon and say, hey, you pushed it out way too early. I can look at the D7000. You know, uh, one of the reasons why I haven't reviewed the D7000 is because it, the camera itself was just that. It was a failure in every way, shape, and form. It was supposed to be one thing, and it turned out to be something else. In this case, it's a little different because Nikon is playing in a field by themselves. All right, so... You don't have a Pentex K5 to compare to the D7000 and properly say, oh, here you go. These are the same kind of architectures in terms of the sensor development and stuff like that. Let's see what each manufacturer can do with it. That's not what you're looking at here. Um, Sony did not want to step into the realm of producing a 36 megapixel camera. They didn't want to do that. And maybe they should have. Maybe they had good reasons for not doing it. It could have been the issues that you see with the Nikon now versus the Sony that led Sony, you know, down the path of saying, hey, you know what, this here doesn't look like this is going to fare too well for us if we are trying to build the most well-rounded camera. Now, to my point of that, you know, uh, some people might be looking at this and saying, well, Doug, you're taking a full-frame Sony, why don't you take the Canon? Because Nikon and Canon are head competitors. Well, it's real simple. I'm not taking the Canon. Uh, the Pentex, you know, K5 2S, you know, beat the Canon in our last round of ISO tests. So I don't need to sit up here and take something that I know has already been crippled in the, you know, versus rounds of the camera arenas that we're doing here for evaluations. I'll use the Canon at some point. It's just that right now there's no point in it. There simply just isn't. Now, what I will do is I will take the Pentex K, K5 II, and I'll compare it to this, you know, Nikon D800. And you can see 
what happens. D eight hundred E. Okay, and see what happens there. But getting back to the Sony, um, I have to say I'm pleased with the results. Uh, now, one of the things that does bother me personally about the the Alpha A99 is its noise control. I thought it would be way, way, way better than uh, what it was. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's life. You know, you don't get it all. But I can understand why now. I mean, I can understand why Sony made some of the cuts they made. And once again, trying to make it affordable for the enthusiast at a $3,000-ish price point. When you factor in the video, when you factor in the fact that things shoot six frames a second, when you factor in the fact that you can actually interpolate, and by no stretch of the imagination does the Nikon even come close to the Sony in terms of the interpolation, yeah, you know what, this kind of makes sense. Now, I think I would give Sony a little advice here, not that they need my advice, because obviously they built a camera that was able to excel past the Nikon, and I would say this one thing. Have this kind of system as an option for post-processing directly embedded in the firmware of the camera. That's what I would do. That's exactly what I would do. Because technically this for them could change everything. You know, when Sony first came out, uh, Sony was the first one to release a 10 megapixel camera that people had taken notice of uh, with the Alpha 100. Uh, Sony was the first really to release a 24 megapixel camera with the Alpha 900. You know, um, Sony has always pushed the envelope. And this is just one more success, you know, in their book that they're going to be able to speak to. It just comes down to how well they're going to be able to market it when it's all said and done. If they understand the weaknesses of the other manufacturers in relationship to their camera, then I'm quite sure they can start a campaign to get themselves where they want to be on the whole SLR thing. But we'll see. So with that being said, you guys take care. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.